Ukraine is the only country on earth where fetal stem cell therapy is legal and regulated. And then learning that stem cells is the only place in the world that you can actually get those, um, I was on board. It's scary like to bring a child into the world and not know that you have a reliable method of healing if your disease gets worse. The stem cell treatment in Ukraine is, it's my safety net. If something happens to him, we're going to Ukraine immediately. I can enjoy my life. I can enjoy being me again, which I felt had slipped away. Like I'd look in the mirror and I, I didn't know who I was looking at because I, any joy that I had was gone. I can write, I can paint, I can play guitar again. Whereas before this, I couldn't. So, it changed my life. I asked his speech therapist and I said to her, I'm like, is he ever going to talk? And she was like, the way things are going, I don't think so. Now, like he talks so much, like it's like, can you be quiet for a second? <laughs> so when I've seen um, my neurologist and I told him that I, after my first trip to Ukraine that I had uh, gone there, the first reaction was dismissal. He said, it was, well, you should have told me, I would have told you you were wasting your time and money. But the last time he's, uh, he's seen me, he told me, he says, well, after all, maybe that treatment did you, did you good. You can plan on, by the time she's uh, seven or eight in a wheelchair, feeding tube because they don't have an appetite. They'll have a rod in their back because of scoliosis. At night, she'd have oxygen to help her breathe because the lungs, it affects the lungs uh, in a big way. And so that's, that's really what we are looking at. And now she's 13, nine years later, and she's thriving. Yeah, she's completely stable and Sophia is 100% independent. We just wish it wasn't so far. So why? Why do we have to go so far? They would never do this treatment in the United States. The number one prescription in America is thyroid medication, and guess what you don't need to take if you get fetal stem cells? You don't need to take your thyroid medication, at least I don't. We flew into Poland, and we're on this train. I entered a war zone to get the treatment. I feel privileged to have gotten here and it was worth the trek, even with the danger element, and I would do it again. We have to go across the world for something that helps. Not just us, but lots and lots of families and individuals. Shame on somebody. In 1893, German pathologist George Schmorl first documented the presence of fetal cells in the maternal body to later be observed that these retained fetal cells have stem cell-like properties. Since that time, scientists worldwide have ubiquitously confirmed this phenomenon. Fetal cells migrate into the mother during pregnancy and in humans can persist for decades. The fetal cells also appear to target sites of injury, crossing both the placental and blood-brain barriers to migrate into diverse tissues and to differentiate into multiple cell types, which is particularly interesting since the fetus has different genes than the mom. Some of the first scientists to evolve this discovery into a medical treatment did so while managing a devastating tragedy. There has been a nuclear accident in the Soviet Union. One of the atomic reactors at the Chernobyl atomic power plant near the city of Kiev was damaged. The Chernobyl disaster resulted in some people suffering from aplastic anemia, otherwise known as bone marrow failure. And to this day, a bone marrow transplant is the only cure. Just weeks after the event, the LA Times reported a major problem that confronted the physicians in the first frantic days was to find suitable bone marrow donors. 
In a few rare cases, physicians had been known to use fetal liver cells as substitutes for adult bone marrow. The first case of our treatment was a case of aplastic anemia. This was a child, and he was completely dependent on the blood transfusions, completely. Once per week, blood transfusion, and this kept him alive in about two months. He rapidly flourished after this treatment. This was amazing, and this was what we made. Wow. This is Dr. Alexei Karpenko and Dr. Alexander Smigadu. They are two of the earliest pioneers of fetal stem cell therapy in Kyiv, Ukraine. I tracked down Dimitro, the aplastic anemia patient they had cured using only fetal liver cells back in 1991. To this day, Dimitro never had any other therapy for his bone marrow failure since being injected intravenously with fetal liver cells decades earlier. I was hired uh, at the Coordinated Center for Transplantology of Ministry of Health, and I founded there a department for fetal stem cell transplantation. So formally, I got the position of the person in charge for fetal stem cell transplantation in our country. Uh, MCEL was a private company which was uh, established, founded in the beginning of 1994 just for development of this invention this was the single university level clinic in the world devoted to this single problem of fetal stem cell transplantation this is our only topic of our investigation originally operating from a single room in a kiev state hospital m cell has since evolved into this Ukraine continues to be the only country on earth that this technology has been formally approved and legalized. The lack of regulatory approval elsewhere, especially in the United States, is partly due to the contention that these stem cells are obtained exclusively from end of first trimester abortions. Women have been finding ways to end pregnancy since historically since 1000 BC. No one's out there getting pregnant to support stem cell <laughs> exactly. research to have an abortion. I, yeah, I think it's much more beneficial than the way that abortions are handled in our country where it's just thrown out, you know? At least it can go to something that it can be beneficial to somebody else. Yeah, might as well use it. I do think that if like the United States says, we think this would promote abortion or something like that, I think that's ridiculous. I don't know the statistic off the top of my head, but I can imagine that there's probably thousands of abortions happening in the United States daily. Why would you need to force an abortion in order to get the stem cells to provide the treatment? That doesn't make any sense to me. I think it's a shame. I mean, there's millions of fetuses that are aborted every year. And it's, I mean, we could be putting all the that tissue, the fetuses, to good work and study them. Obviously, M cells figured it out, and people are getting healed, um, and you know, miraculous things are happening. I mean, and it's just too bad the United States isn't able to do that yet. I mean, hopefully, maybe sometime in the future. But we're not going to speak to 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 women and convince them from aborting just to have stem cells. We're talking about people who made the decision. And I'm thankful that the person who had decided to terminate their pregnancy, donated the, the fetus and the cells were able to be extracted to help other people with chronic disease. And it changed my entire life. So yeah, I'm really good with that fact. And in conversation, you know, with someone at church, I was just talking about, and she looked at me and she says, oh, well, you don't ever have to do that again. Don't ever do the fetal stem cells again. And I'm thinking, I wasn't apologizing for it. I was telling you how amazing it is that Sophie is doing so well. And she's telling me from her only point of view was this is a horrible thing and you should never do it again. And I'm like, oh, we're like so on the different page. <laughs> like, that's not what I'm saying. So then I've learned not to talk about it because people couldn't grasp that we, you know, we were horrible people for saving our daughter's life. So, yeah. After 30 years of development, Fetal stem cell therapy doesn't just include the cells derived from the fetal liver, which is how this therapy was given its start after Chernobyl. Instead, this protocol has evolved into utilizing stem cells from virtually all the organ systems of the human body, aimed at addressing a wide variety of neurological and immunological conditions.
I am the first science and medicine documentarian to have ever been granted access to this laboratory, which occupies the entire fourth floor, where all the harvesting, sorting, testing, and storing of fetal stem cells occurs daily, to later be delivered to patients on the remaining floors. The most important part of this floor is the biotechnology laboratory. Can you tell us what a GMP biotech laboratory, what does GMP mean? Ah, good manufacturing practice. According to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, good manufacturing practice ensures the quality of products by carefully monitoring manufacturer's compliance with its regulations. The regulations make sure the product is safe for use and that it has the ingredients and strength it claims to have, which theoretically qualifies M-Cell to submit to the US FDA for the approval process of fetal stem cells. And we are the only one in the world which produce the fetal stem cell preparation. According to the World Health Organization, there is an estimated 40 to 50 million abortions performed annually worldwide, virtually all of which are discarded as biological waste, with a minute fraction of this fetal material being donated locally to M-Cell's laboratory, with the express written consent of each donor. The target time to obtain the most viable fetal material is the end of first trimester, our work starts from the moment that they donated to us. The hospital gives us the fetuses and we transport it here and then with our process starts. So how long after its arrival? You must act quickly, yes? We act immediately. It's very important because each minute can influence on the quality of the fetal stem cell preparation. And sometimes we have like one hour ago it was harvest, and now it's already preparing the fetal stem cell preparations. Immediately following the abortion procedure, the donated fetal material, along with a blood sample of its donor, arrives at M-Cell's laboratory. Its temperature is checked, and the material is logged into their system. The fetal material is then immediately delivered to their scientists for extraction. the box inside and need to wait when the air inside of the chamber changed and then the indicator becomes green. After the cells are successfully extracted, they are immediately sent to cryopreservation. The key point of the cryopreservation is to guarantee the percentage of live cells. After our cryopreservation process, we have 98% of live cells in each of our fetal stem cell preparations. So this program is unique because if you look through the other publications for other stem cells, not only fetal stem cells, they have 70 or 80% of live cells and we have 98, so we're really very proud of it. After cryopreservation, samples from the new fetal material are tested for harmful bacteria using an FDA-approved BACT Alert 3D microbial detection system. These tests are done three separate times to ensure accuracy. Simultaneously, samples of the same fetal material, along with the donor's blood, are tested in a certified PCR laboratory for any viral infections. You can see how many tests we have done. And from all of the tests, we have one positive for HCV. HCV. Hepatitis C. So that fetus, you cannot use it? No, we cannot use it. And you need to understand that this is not the positive test in the sample of the stem cell preparation. It's the positive test in the donor's blood. And if we uh -huh. even have the positive result in the donor's blood and don't have it in all our checkups in the fetus stem cell preparations, we still don't use it and still discard it. What is the percentage that you find of fetuses that you cannot use? 10%. Okay. Nearly 10% of the fetuses, we cannot use it. 
there are different reasons for that. There, are, there is a microbiology sterility, infection sterility, and also the quality control of the proliferation potency of, right. the, of the stem cells. There is the, the main three reasons why we can discard the fetal stem cell preparations. So even if the samples are clean of all viruses and diseases, the viability of the cells are not good? Yeah, sometimes it happens because of the... There's different reasons, because not each fetus is the same. They are different, and development of their difference, and the donors also are different, and the style of their life are different, and we don't know exactly what influence on the quality of the stem cells proliferation potency. Sometimes we have the sterile sample, the microbiology test was good, the PCR test also was good, but the quality of the proliferation of the stem cells is not enough, so we also discard it. These tests are also done three separate times to ensure accuracy, comprehensively testing for viral contamination. Once the samples have been cleared for safety, they head to the research and development department, where they focus on the quality and viability of the cells starting with checking their physical characteristics and overall morphology. Using a flow cytometer, they begin to separate the cell types from one another with specialized markers, as well as checking their mitochondrial or energy potential, which is crucial to predict how efficient the cells will behave in the patient after injection. You put one cell and you wanted to test to see if it was going to replicate, yes. and to see how healthy it is, and, and that one cell created that. Yes. This is live, real-time video of a single cardiomyocyte, or fetal heart stem cell, beating in real time that I recorded while there. This is live video of a colony of the same fetal heart cells beating in unison after allowing them to proliferate in vitro, starting from a single fetal heart cell. This is time-lapse footage of the fetal endothelial stem cells, which are responsible for the construction of our blood vessels and building new capillaries to aid in increased blood circulation after they are injected. We are watching, in vitro, the fetal endothelial cells forming their own newly formed vascular system. So you're basically mimicking what it would be like once the cell goes into the human body? Yep. Okay. We do not cultivate the fetal stem cells. Right. We just check up how they uh, replicate in vitro. So then we can be sure that it will be replicating in the organism of our patient. So it really is about only administering the right amount of cells for each patient because once they're injected, that happens. Yeah, very often the, uh, the patient asks how many uh, stem cells you will inject. Of course, when we are talking about the cultivated stem cells, it's important to know how many stem cells you will be injected because they already proliferate in vitro and they don't have any potency to proliferate in the body. So, but when we are talking about the fetal stem cells, they can replicate. When other companies use cultivated stem cells, they cannot define their proliferative potential because they already use that potential in vitro. Yeah? And now, if we are using the fetal stem cells, not cultivated stem cells, the whole their potential cover up the whole body of the patient. And we don't uh, waste it uh, in, vi in, in vitro cultivation. So that's why the amount of fetal stem cells may be not so high like, like the cultivated stem cells, but the proliferative potential of them is like in 100 times higher when we are talking about like autological. Very often you hear people say, why do you need new fetuses all the time? Why can't you just cultivate and replicate from one? But you're explaining that it's not nearly as powerful for a therapy yeah, because they're not this is capable of going into the body and reproducing like the non-cultivated cells. Yeah. So what you're doing is basically the most powerful version of fetal stem cell therapy. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, it's not only the most powerful of fetal stem cell therapy, it's the most powerful in the whole world 
and in whole researches of the stem cells clinical use. Why? Because we have like three types of stem cells, embryonic stem cells, yeah, fetal stem cells and also autologicals or allogenic but cultivated cells. Embryonic is not safe. So they can cause the cancer, everybody knows about that. Embryonic stem cells are derived from four to five day old blastocysts after in vitro fertilization. There are no organs or organ specific stem cells formed at four to five days of gestation. Embryonic stem cells have a unique ability to develop into any type of cell in the body, which creates a problem, tumor formation. The ability of embryonic stem cells to form non-cancerous tumors called teratomas is one of their defining traits. It's also a frightening one, particularly for those who hope to develop therapies from the cells. Fetal stem cells are organ-specific stem cells derived from the tissues of a developing fetus obtained between the 7th and 11th week of gestation. These cells have already undergone specialization in the germ layers and are tissue specific. Fetal stem cells are safe. They are not cultivated, so they don't lose its potential. And the autological or differentiated, yeah, for example, uh, Mesenchymal stem cells, they don't have any potential uh, when they are injected. So maybe they can influence how in some way, but it cannot be so useful and it can hold for, for the years, like we are talking about the fetal stem cells. Now just walk towards me, just walk. No, just walk normal, just walk towards me. This is four-year-old Sophia Jones, around the time a pediatric neurologist diagnosed Sophia with Ulrich congenital muscular dystrophy. And so when her doctor, um, he was a specialist in this particular disease, which is Ulrich muscular dystrophy, um, he did say that she's healthy now, but not for long. And she's four years old. She's as sweet as can be. That just was a complete shock. I mean, to know she's healthy now, not for long, like what does that mean? The lifespan is uh, probably 19, 20 years old. Yeah. Um, you can plan on by the time she's uh, seven or eight in a wheelchair, feeding tube because they don't have an appetite. At night, she'd have oxygen to help her breathe because the lungs, it affects the lungs. And the other people that we've met in this situation, these people need assistance from when they start school. They have a yeah. full-time assistant next to them. And you think about that as they age, and Sophia's 13 years old now, and um, the dignity like that goes along with you want your privacy as you get older and you always have to have an aide with you or mom or dad or helping her to get out of the door to go to the bathroom uh, to have an aide with her full time. I can't imagine waking up five times a night and having to turn my child because you know they need to be repositioned and they cannot turn themselves or too weak. Her doctor, when I would ask questions, he would actually say, well, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. And I didn't, you don't really know what you're dealing with. And quite frankly, you know, you're not supposed to look on the internet and that's exactly what we do. You know, you go home and I mean, it was very dark, dark days ahead of us because it was shocking. But I think what's more shocking is that they have nothing to offer you. Mm -hmm. And, and so they gave us a diagnosis, they gave us a prognosis, and then they tell us to come back every three to six months to measure her decline because there is no progression there's just going to be regression from there and that's really the solution there is no drug if there was a drug i mean at that point you're willing to do anything right i might even take a drug i'd take anything but there was nothing concrete that we could do when we left the clinic we were hoping for some type of treatment well things he, that we could do he for did her. say it was like maybe in 10 years there's going to be something so in 10 years uh, okay but Let's talk about the Jerry Lewis, you know, he, here he raised $2.45 billion and that was like 50 years ago and we still have nothing. When her doctor diagnosed her, he said, lots of parents are desperate and just so you know, not to bother trying anything because he said he's seen parents go broke, you know, like literally because you're so desperate and you're trying everything and nothing will work. And so that was his advice, like, do not put your money into anything else because I'm telling you, it will not work. 
So that was the picture. That was the picture that we were you know, like painted. This is what we're gonna, she was diagnosed at four. And that's kind of the picture of that we were like looking for for the next, I don't know, 16, 17 years. Less than a year of Sophia's diagnosis, her parents discovered fetal stem cell therapy and decided to give it a try. I wish you would tell me why. Do you want to build a snowman? This is Sophia at muscular dystrophy camp at age six, after receiving two annual fetal stem cell therapies in 2012 and 2013. The girl in the wheelchair to the right is eight years old and has Sophia's exact same diagnosis, Ulrich congenital muscular dystrophy. Everyone is actually in that situation except for us. I first met Sophia the following year after her fourth fetal stem cell therapy. After the very first treatment, within that next week, she went from falling 15 to 20 times a day down to no times. She doesn't fall anymore. <laughs> Sophie, we're getting you a hula hoop, girl. What? Are you ready? Yep. <laughs> and I've been following Sophia's journey ever since. Going back to the doctor who gave her the diagnosis. Um, we sat down, I'll never forget, we sat down in the office and he said, how are things going? As he's looking at his computer and we said, really good. And his neck about snapped off because he doesn't, you he don't doesn't hear, hear that. really good yeah. in his office. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, what's going on? You could tell that he was just super surprised to, to hear that she's doing well. Actually mm -hmm. better than the year before. Because mm -hmm. they want you to come back every year to, to just measure their decline. Mm -hmm. right? And uh, we were, it was exciting to show them that she's gotten better. That's great. Yeah. That's awesome. No more falling down. Congratulations. That's no, awesome. no pain. <laughs> How do you personally feel, like, like you're, if you remember last year and then after you got home, did you feel like you noticed any differences? Well, later in the year I noticed my grades and yeah. I liked school mm -hmm. more than I hated school, which right. was, I would never think that would ever happen, but... Partly due to confusion from Sophia's American doctors over her improvements, in 2016, when Sophia was eight years old, four years after her original diagnosis, a direct DNA sequencing analysis of Sophia's genes was conducted, evaluating the various mutations related to Ulrich congenital muscular dystrophy, which further cemented Sophia's diagnosis, showing heterozygous mutations of the COL6A2 gene, making it nearly impossible to argue that Sophia has been misdiagnosed. The Muscular Dystrophy Association also recommends this DNA test because genetic testing can shorten the time to diagnosis and prevent misdiagnosis of muscular dystrophies. And so, yeah, the doctor, this last, just our recent uh, Yeah, within the last visit, six months. She was surprised and mm -hmm. questioned the diagnosis. Because she's never seen a child at her age look like her. Um, by that point, you know, they are in a wheelchair full time and they're you know using a feeding, feeding tube and a respirator and she's just never needed anything like that and because of the, the scoliosis a lot of times they have to put rods in their back at that point it's worth noting that the peer-reviewed medical literature on ulrich muscular dystrophy states most of the patients die of respiratory failure in the first decade of life Can we say that the situation pretty much like the same in comparison to the last time? Last time? time? Yeah. I would say stronger. Stronger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say a lot more endurance mm -hmm. um, with school and walking. Good. Mm -hmm. What about strength in extremities? Like with strength? Hands? Do you feel like you're stronger with your hands? Kind of, probably the same. Probably the same. The same. Mm -hmm. And what about physical therapy? Are you doing physical it therapy? Yes. Mm -hmm. like, We're doing like a regular basis. Physical yeah. therapy. Okay. She is now um, taking initiative 
to do a lot of it on her own. Okay. So she's um, walking on the treadmill every single day, mm -hmm. one mile at least, about a mile, and she can do two miles. Great job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you feel sometimes any pain in your body? No, no painful feeling. Mm. What about your breathing? Is it smooth and normal? Yeah, that's <laughs> good. good. Kids by 10, they're not walking with her condition. She's 13 and she keeps improving in strength. And so she's just very stable. Hi. 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 You too. Yeah. What are you guys gonna do? Swim. So nothing it has gotten worse through all of these years. You know, you're always worried about it. Even though we're doing all of this stuff for her, you're always in the back of your mind, like, is there something that's going to happen? Yeah, sure, of course. But her muscles and everything are showing that they're completely stable. So that's huge. It's huge. It's huge. I'm just so proud. I'm so proud of it. Everything's so good. Yeah, I'm so awesome. happy. While following patients for this story, I frequently found family members also trying fetal stem cell therapy. You know, through the years watching Sophia receive these treatments and having a benefit, I thought, you know, I'm, I'm here, I'm going up across the world with her, so I thought I'd give it a shot. There is a lot that goes into a major diagnosis like that and the stress that comes along with it, and I think it triggers a lot of different things, and along with that came uh, diagnosis of celiac, Hashimoto's, and Sjogren's. And so I was physically watching my body just completely, I was getting inflamed, I couldn't control, my weight was going up. There was, I mean, I wasn't swelling. changing anything. Yeah, I was just swelling every day. My yeah. eyes were poofed out and yeah. I was just getting really, I was declining very quickly. And it was almost like spiraling out of control. Um, Immediately, my uh, inflammation started going away yeah. and my numbers improved dramatically. So it was great to have some blood work to refer to so I could see that my blood work was um, improving. So my Hashimoto's is now uh, fine. I don't take medication for my thyroid and my celiac. Uh, the, uh, that's, Which is huge, by the way. That's negative. I no longer am celiac. Um, Sjogren's, I think still there's something there, but I, I don't really deal with the effects of it, so I don't notice it. So, I, I mean, I'm thrilled. Yeah. I'm, I'm thankful I can do it. Yeah, she's come miles and miles away from, yeah. you know, just her energy and mm -hmm. uh, really life yeah. being yeah. sucked back into her. So yeah. that's, it's um, made a big difference. Yeah. Um, yeah. In America, with all the autologous, so adult stem cells, they are like a big boom. People like to, oh, I, I had that done, I had the stem cells. Yes, there is some influence of injected of the autological stem cells, but it's not the same and they cannot be sure that it will be divided. When we are talking about the adult stem cells, there is two types of procedures. One, when the person just took the stem cells, like from the fat, mm -hmm. for example, is the most popular. Mm -hmm. There is two ways. They took from the fat and then they injected uh, directly to the blood in like in, a, in an hour <laughs> in your body was stem cells they took from your body stem cells and just injected the same stem cells into your body how we can uh, expect it a big results from that of course not uh, and the second way when they took uh, the stem cells from your fat and then they cultivated them but if they cultivated them they have two, uh, two options. The first one, uh, they uh, start proliferate and uh, all their potential was wasted in vitro, yeah, in, in the Petri dish. And then they injected to the patient, the, the first one reason why, it, why it's not so effective. And the second one is the same your stem cells. They have the same epigenetic uh, memory. They have the same uh, mistakes in their DNA. So, uh, it's very low uh, opportunity them to work or to improve really rare or or hard diseases. Yeah, or neurological. Or neurological, of course. And uh, uh, you know there is also the uh, always are talking about that. Okay, we differentiated uh, stem cells. We took your stem cells, and they will be differentiated into the neuronal stem cells. Of course, when you have the commercial mediums. 
and you put there inside like thousands of uh, micro elements and growth factors, of course they may, may transform to the neuronal stem cells in vitro. But in your body there is no such growth factors in such amount. So how can they transfer to the neuronal stem cells? They cannot. So people getting adult stem cells for Parkinson's and things like that, they're, they're not really going to be helped because it cannot really help their neural nervous uh, system. Directly it cannot. How can mesenchymal stem cells took from your fat become neuronal cell from your head? Right, your Why it does, does not transfer uh, from your fat to your head in your body? If it can, so it will be improved by itself. It's almost impossible. Yeah. Also, you uh, need to know about uh, the main limitation. Uh, if you uh, cultivate your adult stem cells from your body, you have uh, only uh, around 50 divisions. You will have uh, the problem with uh, the, it will be elderly cells, uh, and uh, they have no any uh, proliferative potential when you inject it in the body. Adult stem cells, also known as mesenchymal stem cells, are generally obtained from an adult's bone marrow or fat. However, they do not have the ability to transform into vital organ-specific stem cells like brain cells after human injection. Similarly, umbilical cord stem cells also lack the ability to transform into vital organ-specific stem cells such as brain cells after human injection. In contrast, fetal stem cells, which are already vital organ-specific stem cells, do not require transformation after injection to provide a wide array of genuine vital organ-specific stem cells, including neurological or brain stem cells, because they already are organ-specific stem cells at the time of injection. What is your kind of response to people that get umbilical cord cells? Uh, for similar ailments as what people go to themselves for? With umbilical cord blood is the same situation like with ophthalogicals or with the fat stem cells. Why? Again, they hope if they use it, it will be transformed in the neuronal stem cells. But there is no reason why they need to start to differentiate in that. The only benefit of the cord blood stem cells comparing to fat is that it's allogenic, that not, not your cells. But it cannot help in the neurological diseases because it's not, there is no way how they can do that. There is no mechanism for that. Which would mean that clinics and clinical trials around the world offering autologous stem cells derived from the patient's fat or bone marrow or allogenic stem cells derived from an umbilical cord or another adult are deficient in helping patients with neurological conditions, such as Parkinson's or multiple sclerosis. These companies do transparently state that they use only mesenchymal stem cells, which has been clearly documented in the mainstream medical literature to be unable to transform into vital organ cells after human injection. Mesenchymal stem cells can only transform into bone, cartilage, muscle, fat, and connective tissue after human injection. You see? Uh, so you can see the another color and another structure and also you can see the connections between the cells. So they already proliferated to the neuronal cells. So you can see connections between them. These connections is the connections with which transfer the information. They're starting to communicate with one another and, and build network. connections. So this is what happens inside the body after injection. Yep. You can see the example. This is the neurons and their the connections. We are literally seeing neuronal connections. Yeah. This is time-lapse footage of fetal neuronal cells in vitro, proliferating, creating new synapses, and communicating with one another, thus creating their own newly formed neuronal network. Fetal stem cells are the only stem cell type where true neuronal stem cells can be obtained which is crucial for regenerating neuronal tissue for degenerative neuronal diseases. In 2018, while following Sophia's story, I met Xavier, a Parkinson's patient who had just arrived to Kiev for his first fetal stem cell treatment. 
Um, I found about the M cell uh, about a month ago. I've been uh, diagnosed about five years ago uh, with Parkinson, and uh, I'm really hoping to improve the quality of my life overall. I think uh, so far I've been coping fairly well, but I feel that the disease is progressing, obviously. I can notice you're mildly shaking now. Yeah. Uh, that, that's the Parkinson's at the moment. That's the Parkinson's. Okay. Yeah. okay. Xavier found his results to be positive enough for him to receive a second round of fetal stem cell therapy three years later. The thing which is interesting, and this is where I believe that uh, my treatment helped me quite a bit, is this since the moment I started to take drugs until today, the dosage that, I, that I've been taking is exactly the same than five or six years ago. If you look at the, um, the stats of all people with similar diseases, within five years, the drugs that they take, you regularly, every six months to a year, you have to increase the dosage of the frequency. I have not changed anything as of yet, and the treatment that he gave me five years ago is exactly the same than the one I'm taking today. So when I've seen um, the, the, my neurologist and I told him that I, after my first trip to Ukraine that I had uh, gone there, the first reaction was dismissal. He's, uh, he was, well, you should have told me, I would have told you you were wasting your time and money. And when I've seen him um, after the treatment, it was well like three, four, five months after the first treatment, he looked at me and he says, well, you know, maybe that treatment did you, did you good. I feel that it certainly slowed down quite a bit the, the progression. It doesn't mean that I'm cured because I still feel, you know, sometimes uh, the, the symptoms and um, but I, overall, I'm very happy that to see that it's a very slow progression. It, it really helped me quite a bit. This is Bill, a 78-year-old who was diagnosed with Parkinson's when he was 72. Bill received his first fetal stem cell treatment in 2020. I caught up with Bill arriving for his second treatment. This place, does it remind you of Space Odyssey 2001? It's like something out of a science fiction movie. Yeah, it is. yeah, yeah. Really it's great. So if you don't mind, we'll ask you a few questions about the, the results you had after the previous treatment. So can you tell us what results you had? How can you explain it? I had a number of things that went very well for me. I had a uh, bad joint, which was very painful. Rarely do I have problems with it now. My knees were kind of sore. Mm -hmm. No problems. I had a rotator cuff, a uh, major tear in my shoulder. I still have some limitation in that, but it's probably 80% of what it was originally. My doctor said I had a heart murmur, and that seemed to be gone. What about your walk? Did you see any kind of improvements in that? Everything was better. My golf game got better. All my friends that have seen me before and after the treatment were very uh, complimentary on how much better I looked. What I did, every year I go to a, a physical therapist and a occupational therapist and a voice coach. I had gone year after year. And after the treatment, everything had improved. I was faster on the, the tests that they gave me, a lot faster. Mm -hmm. When they test your strength in your hand, they uh, commented that not only was I stronger for a 78, but for a 48-year-old guy. <laughs> During our last treatment when you were here, mm -hmm. you told us that it was difficult for you to pronounce the words, to make the sentences in general. After the treatment, did you see any improvements? Yes. No. What about your mood in general? I'm a happy guy. <laughs> Many adult patients treated for neurological conditions, like Parkinson's, have the neuronal and relevant nervous system fetal stem cells injected intrathecally, which is a procedure where the cells are injected directly into the spinal fluid, allowing for a more direct delivery into the brain. This injection not only includes various neuronal, fetal stem, and progenitor cells, but a very high concentration of dopamine progenitor cells as well, which is particularly unique and important since Parkinson's disease is, 
a neurodegenerative disorder that affects predominantly the dopamine-producing neurons in the brain. My name is Louis Verloop. I'm a chiropractor in Surprise, Arizona. Bill is a patient of mine. I've been working on Bill since 2009. He was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2014. Uh, I've been taking care of him now sporadically since he's had the Parkinson's. I see a number of Parkinson's patients probably two to three a week. Um, and one of the things that I notice that over the years, they tend to get stiffer and stiffer and stiffer to the point where um, it becomes very difficult to adjust them. I have to use different types of methods of moving the joints around. But it's still at this point, I'm able to get uh, good adjustments in his neck. He's loose enough to allow that. I'm able to get good adjustments in his mid-back, which he's able to allow that. And whereas many other people at his level, I, I've no longer been able to get structural adjustments in those areas because they've just become too rigid. So uh, whatever therapy he's doing, I believe it's helping, at least from what I can feel in the spine and the mobility is still there and allows me to still move some of his joints around. And Bill continues to enjoy greater strength and mobility. Aha. Oh, it's you. Yeah. I didn't recognize yeah. you with that yeah. mysterious yeah. mask. This Hi. is Anna. <laughs> this is Lawrence, who was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in early 2011. Lawrence's first fetal stem cell therapy was later the same year, in 2011. And he has been receiving fetal stem cell therapy almost every year ever since. I first met Lawrence in 2015. We're on our way to see Dr. Tell. So then the only thing you're really taking that might affect the course of the disease would be Rebif, which really does not affect the course of the disease. And that's pretty much true, yeah. Okay, let me see you stand up. Let's see how you do. This is without a cane now. Yes. Let me see you walk, if you don't mind. I'll turn around. He walks fairly well without assistance, as you can see. Uh, bring your hands out. Go like this. I'll bring them together. Bring them together. Just, okay, to the horizontal. There's no tremor, which there was initially. How about your grasp? Squeeze. Good. Very good strike there. Very good. So as you can see, he's made pretty good progress, considering. How about the dizziness, then? That was a big deal, the dizziness. I, I feel pretty sturdy these days. Okay. Uh, my observation is that if I didn't know what he had, I pri at this point, I might not know. I can't attribute the improvement to anything else that we're giving him. Ordinarily, in your experience, if you don't mind me asking, Go ahead. Um, considering how many years ago he's been diagnosed, 2011, like, what do you usually see? Some people will just go on down the trail and become worse and worse and worse and become bedridden, which I have seen. And they'll fail every therapy. He's basically reached, I would say, a plateau and stabilized where he's no longer declining. I'm very impressed with what I'm looking at, I gotta tell you. And I've been at it 50 years almost, and that ought to tell you something. And he's been my patient for about 30. So what do we say about all this? I don't know, except to say that there's something that works here. I don't think it's anything we're giving him, I really don't. And thank goodness we don't have to do a lot. He doesn't use canes anymore, I mean, I'm pleased. <laughs> What else can I tell you? No, that's all I wanted to hear, is just you be honest. And tell no, I'll tell you the truth. I thought it was crap, I'd tell you that too. I'm the first one, ask him. I see a lot of stuff that's bogus. I was not, in the beginning, enthusiastic about all this. I said, well, if you got the money to waste, go ahead. But then again, you're talking about a disease you can't cure, so with what we have, so why not? I mean, it isn't like it's real. I've never seen anything quite like this, i got to be honest. If I had the best, I, I would never think anything like this would work. But it did. And I'm, you know, proof of the pudding. I haven't seen anybody get this well. Anything else? That's it. I mean, this is perfect. Yeah, I don't want to, yeah. Now, you'd think I was a salesman for the thing. But, <laughs> but you know what? Salesman, no salesman. I'm glad to see him better. Whatever it takes. 
I'm really happy about it. I mean, as his doctor. But he was unsteady, my God, yes. And he wouldn't let him walk without assistance. So look where we are today. I got married in January to, to my fabulous Anna. Congratulations. Thank yes, you. Congrats, guys. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, when I first got diagnosed, like when it finally came down from an MS doctor, he looked at me and said, look, he goes, I got bad news. You have progressive, primary progressive MS. And it's just going to get worse. When you hear that, it's like getting hit in the face with a sledgehammer. I kind of shut off and shut down. I, I didn't know how to be around people. I actually gave my girlfriend a way out. I said, look, I don't know how bad this is going to get. We were only like less than a year into our relationship. I said, I don't want to drag you into this misery because it's going to get dark. And at times it did get dark. I mean, did I ever think about killing myself? Absolutely. Um, it never really got better until I, I went to M cell and, you know, after the first day of treatment, I can't say I wasn't skeptical because I was, even though I knew the science was there, I was like, you know, I know it doesn't work for everybody in, in varying degrees. But, you know, after the first day and I could bend my leg and I wasn't exhausted anymore and I could pick up a pen and sign the room service check. And when I got back to the States, um, the biggest thing was, is like, I could drive my car with one foot, whereas I was driving with two feet, one gas, one brake, because my reaction time wasn't all that great. So these are just, I mean, I know it sounds like they're just little things, but when you can't do them, I got back and I was able to paint and hold a paintbrush. I was able to pick up a guitar and just play simple bar chords, I, I, which I hadn't been able to do in a really long time. I wasn't able to finger pick because my right hand didn't work, so. I couldn't do that before. I, you know, I don't have any of the, the tingling, the cold hands, the cold feet. Overall, I'm, I look at it as I'm 85% better and I'm not in a wheelchair and my progression has stopped. I haven't gotten any worse. I've only gotten better. My neurologist, um, who thought basically I'd be in a wheelchair by now, um, was amazed that I could walk on, the, on all his tests, which is on a level of one to five scale, I went from one and one and a half to three and a half, four, five on some of them. Scott was officially diagnosed with primary progressive multiple sclerosis in December of 2019. He received his first fetal stem cell therapy in May of 2021. This interview took place in December of 2021, eight months after his first therapy. Come on, old boy. You slow down, okay? It takes five minutes. You know, I, I actually considered selling this house because I wanted to live on one floor. Especially when they told me I was going to be in a wheelchair. I just, I didn't know like how my life was going to change. In 2011, I had suffered four back-to-back -back heart attacks. I went to M cell, and I came back six months. I had a follow-up with my cardiologist, and she looked at me and she said, "Well." Other than the three stents you have in your heart, she's like, I don't see any damage. She goes, you know, it's, it's what was there has repaired itself. I, I, there was some ha kind of strange stuff in my blood work before I went to M-Cell, but last month I had a full blood work up. And he's like, everything is normalized. You, you're, you're right where you need to be for a 53 year old man. You know, any damage that was there before you left has now corrected itself. My cholesterol had dropped 32 points, which in less than six months, basically, which was another side effect of my stem cell treatment, which if that's the worst side effect, I'm okay with it. So would I do it again? Absolutely. This is Chad, who was diagnosed with an aggressive form of multiple sclerosis in November of 2018. Just three months after his diagnosis, Chad received his first fetal stem cell therapy. Chad then returned to Ukraine for his second therapy in May of 2021. I caught up with Chad that following December. So Chad's initial 
symptoms started in July and the, the symptoms progressed very quickly up to December where he wasn't able to walk down the stairs by himself or cut his own food. He was slurring his words. Um, and so we went to Ukraine in February and by the, the treatments are three days. And by the second day of the treatment, he was able to cut his own steak. He was able to, um, his arm had stopped shaking. He was ha not having the tremors anymore. After he got back, I think the biggest thing I noticed was his walking was so much better. He was getting to the point where he was having to use a cane, especially to walk down hills like outside or something like that. Um, and he didn't have to use a cane anymore. His speech cleared up a lot more yeah. and the fatigue was, he had a lot more energy. Um, and I fell a lot. I was falling um, probably at least bi-weekly and doing your At one point you had said like you were falling that. daily. And yeah. But I've uh, since the trip in May, I haven't fallen at all. Not one fall. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Okay. Yeah, not one fall. But I've been getting better and better. I get stronger every day. I get more coordination every day. Hopefully, uh, everything will come back. But if it just stays like That's it awesome. is, at least I can still work. I can still be a father. I can still do everything I want to do. I mean, honestly, like the biggest thing for me was he can pick up he can pick up his baby like that's huge if he hadn't had the stem cell treatments he wouldn't have any of that mobility in his arm and he might not even have the left side mobility and he's still able to be an active father and play with her and you know do, do yard work yeah do yard work <laughs> <laughs> and all of that fun stuff so that's i mean it's it means everything to us to have that option available to us you know We've seen it work for him twice and yeah. work very well. And his neurologist didn't believe in the stem cell treatment at all. He said that it's like throwing crap to the wall and seeing what sticks. Now, since he's seen Chad's progress, he has become more interested in himself. Um, so it's definitely kind of opened his neurologist eyes to some new things, which is incredible. Sophia, Lawrence, and Chad first received fetal stem cell therapy within one year of their original diagnosis. And Scott received his first therapy within two years. Xavier and Bill received their first therapy within five years of their diagnosis. I noticed that people with degenerative diseases who received fetal stem cell therapy within this general time frame, those people generally had more dramatic positive results. Scientifically, the reason for this would be the regenerative nature of fetal stem cells, fighting against the degenerative nature of their disease. This year is 18 years since I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, and I would suspect I have at minimum 20 years worth of damage, nerve damage, to the central nervous system and brain lesions from multiple sclerosis. And so the damage that I have you know, I, I wasn't expecting it to overnight be improved, but I am seeing improvement and um, improvement in my balance, in my muscle spasticity, um, and that has translated to improvement with walking. I'm not where I want to be at this point. Um, I'm, you know, just trying to increase my endurance. My ability to walk unassisted in my own home is so much improved. My I'm able to get up from the chair, from the bed much more easily. The first day home from MCEL, I was able to walk into my kitchen, make a cup of coffee, carry my coffee to the patio without touching any walls um, or holding on to anyone without using a walker. Um, it's not a great distance, but that's a huge improvement for me. My ability to take a shower, to get dressed, uh, without just overwhelming fatigue, debilitating me for the day is much improved. And I really am hopeful that I can go back to MCEL. I already saw what MS can do unchecked. I don't want to live in a wheelchair. Sure. I don't want to live paralyzed. What else can you take from me? I'm going to gamble because I want something better. We have very great results with the children with autism. It's very high success rate and there is no other medicines for their conditions. You know, there is no medicine for autism kids. Kids cannot lie. They hate the procedures which they are going through here. They cannot lie that they imagine after stem cell treatment they feel better. There is a clear result of the stem cell treatment.
and it makes our work special. In September of 2019, I met seven-year-old Matt and his mother, Amanda. Matt is diagnosed with autism. I also met four-year-old Jax with his parents, Mike and Ashley. Jax is also diagnosed with autism. While both families were there at the exact same time, they did not know each other. The funny thing was when we got off the plane, we saw Amanda and we both looked at each other like, well, what the hell would she be here for? Is she going to? We got off the airplane onto this like shuttle to the airport and I saw this other American family with a son and then I just in my head, I was like, they must be here for the same reason. And then it kind of like, a, it was kind of like a movie. Then like the whole shuttle filled up and then I like never saw them again. Understandably, some parents are nervous giving fetal stem cell therapy to their child for the first time. Oh, I was still, we were I didn't think I was gonna be able to pitch it to her. Yeah. Cause I'm the one who found it just randomly Googling. Like I said, Googling stuff about autism and stumbled upon your, your research and your video, your, the first yeah. documentary. So then once And then I'm like, yo, we're going. And I thought for sure she was gonna be like, no chance. Yeah. <laughs> like, once he sent it to me, then I started <clears throat> looking up scholarly articles and, you know, started printing stuff, but it, it's, it's hard because MCEL really only has one article. That was the only article that I could find from them. And then I couldn't really find, there wasn't, there was barely like any research, anything done, especially in the US because of the controversy. I'm a nurse anesthetist, so I provide anesthesia to children and adults in the hospital setting. So I like took that one article to work and like I asked like a couple of the docs that I work with who like I trust their opinion and they were like, why not? I was a mess the whole time. Like my stomach was just eating itself. I'm like, what the hell did we get ourselves into? I was still sitting in the chair researching stuff yesterday because I was like so nervous. Yeah. Like I'm like, you know, you don't know. You really don't know what they're injecting here. I encouraged these two families to meet so they can remain in contact once they returned back to the States. Well, what we're hoping to get is better communication back and forth. Um, less of like the outbursts and kind of that emotional impulse control where he's not, doesn't go from like one to 100 in a second. Mm -hmm. Mommy, so him out mommy, I will already work. No, we're not leaving yet. And then, you know, maybe in school that he can God, take more I'm information so and be, just be more successful so in school. Done. So Jackson just turned four years old. Mm -hmm. He started showing signs of aggression about 18 months mm -hmm. from that, from you know, from birth to 18 months, absolutely normal development, uh, met all his milestones appropriately. And then about 18 months, we started no noticing like speech regression, like he was saying, mama, dad, you know, a handful of words. And then he stopped. And the more we dug into it, it he ended up being diagnosed with autism. I guess about two and a half, we finally got our diagnosis after waiting for about six months for a doctor's appointment. Um, from then, we did speech. They recommended occupational therapy. And then uh, we started school about three years old. He's in an autism preschool program. And there he gets speech OT, PT. Um, I guess the biggest thing is that he's nonverbal. He has a device he, he pushes to use to talk. Dad, mom, 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 poppy. Dad, mom, 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 poppy. <laughs> Who is it? Dad, mom, 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 poppy. Um, but our hopes were just to give him, you know, a normal life to kind of bring him out of this cage that he's in so that he can speak and communicate and have somewhat of a normal life. Both children received M cells autism protocol. Several months later, I started receiving text messages from both families. Jackson, who is that? Elmo. Elmo. I love you! Yeah! <laughs> Two years later, in 2021, both families decided to meet at MCEL together for a second round of therapy for their children. It's like mind-boggling. It still doesn't even feel real at this point. Like, we've been to there twice now. We've seen amazing results twice. How long was it after the therapy that Jax started speaking for the first time? A week, maybe? I want to say the first, well, was the, I think the first thing we saw, right, was a teacher said that 
they, they put them in wagons in school and they'll drag them like through the hallway, like in the wagon. And I think he saw an owl, right? And he mm-hmm. said like, he said like an owl sound. He went like, woo, woo, like that and pointed at the owl. And he had never done anything like that ever. And that was like, we were back for days, like four days, five days maybe. And that was like, it's funny that at that time that was a gigantic deal. Now, like he talks so much, like it's like, can you be quiet for a second? <laughs> like, <laughs> you know. He was bad, but in the world. He always bad, but in the world. Yo, baby. Who was it all? What's the bonnet for? Oh, yay. It's a white. I need more money. Their bond is pretty strong and stronger than it was, you know, because Jackson's doing so much better. You know what I mean? That they play together and they talk or I miss my brother, I miss Logan and stuff like that. So we've only told like, I mean, friends and family and stuff now. And like, I'm, I'm probably more vocal about it than she is with telling people. Cause I just feel like it should be out there. But of the people you have told, what have been their responses? His like, primary, his primary doctor at Chop the Autism. Oh, doctor. the developmental. Her face got beat red when I told her. She was She was so mad, mad, like beat red mad. Yeah. She was so mad. <clears throat> like, basically was sent, like, that was very dangerous what she did with Jackson and like, there's not enough like study on this, like. We brought the paperwork to show her and she was kind of like, what is this? Like, what do you mean you went there? How could you do this to your child? This is unsafe. And she was like, maybe that's what it was. Maybe that's why he's doing better. Like she didn't really yeah. want to say like. She that, was, yeah. she said like he's <clears throat> grown older and he's been doing therapy and he's been in school and yes, that, those are all contributions to And I'm like success. arguing with her because I'm like, well, yeah, but he came back from MCEL and in one week we were seeing results like a light switch went off <laughs> or went on, should I say. And she just didn't want to hear, well, that's from this and that's from therapy. And well, I'm like, nah, I don't, I don't think so. Yeah. <clears throat> We've been doing therapy for months and months and months and it's just has been like this. <laughs> and then it goes like that. Poopy your pants and poopy your pants and poopy your pants and poopy your pants. And I'm the king. Mom, mom, she says she's good to go. I mean, just immediately, I mean, the language communication was so much better. Um, he started sleeping through the night, which he had never done before. In his own room. In his own room. And so going from three to four word sentences, which is what we were used to. I mean, now he's talking in complete sentences and talking with his brothers and he's happier. Um, just, I mean, we're able to have a more normal dialogue with our son, which we had never done before. So, and then just getting back a few months ago, I mean, we just saw another big increase. And so, um, it's been it's been a monumental difference from what it was a couple years ago, and it's hard to sometimes remember. Like you know, this is what our life was like before. Um, but you know, we have friends and therapists and uh, who remind us. And I mean, it's just been amazing how much better he is. Um, you know, after those two treatments. So, I live three houses down the street, and I was out in my yard the other day, and Matt came whizzing by on his bike, had his helmet on. I says. He says, hi, Grandma. And I said, hi, where are you going? He says, oh, I'm riding my bike to swim team. And I mean, that's, that's not something that would have ever been on the radar screen a couple of years ago. I'd say like after the first one, he went to be able to like follow like maybe one step, two step, like right. first do this, then do this, Matt. And, you know, we felt like that was an improvement. And then even since we got back, it's like, Okay, Matt, you need to do this, 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 and this. And it's like, okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Which is huge. Yeah. So get your jammies on, brush your teeth, clean up your room, and make your bed. I mean, and no problem. Before, impossible. Never would have happened. So Yeah. As Matt has improved, his relationships with his brothers have improved, and our relationship has improved. I've noticed his emotions are more regulated. Biggest thing with the stem cells is his language, the way that he's able to explain things. It, things just kind of seem to be clicking. Mommy, and mom, it's this Fred. Yep, and when does it come? You know, it's not just the child who is making the improvements, it's everyone in their sphere improves when they improve. Certainly not, not like it was before, so yeah. um, it's just been a, it's been a godsend for sure. Screaming, meltdowns, hitting, those kind of things have just 
slowly melted away. And I don't think Matt ever had a slumber party. I actually slept over at a friend's house until like about a year and a half ago after the first round of styles. And man, I remember being so nervous, like, gosh, I hope he doesn't like, you know, do something crazy and the parents are gonna hate us the next day. And I remember talking to him the next morning, like, it was great, Matt was awesome and no problems at all. And so, and then since then we've had tons of sleepovers and I mean, he just is treated like a normal kid and it's been fantastic. So, and that never happened before, literally, so. I've been working with Matt since um, 2016. And when we started, his gap between the kids that were his age and the stuff that he was doing, the gap was really big. Um, when he first started, we were working on just simply connecting two dots. Um, I asked him to write his name and that was, he drew me this line when I said, Matt, write your name. And he wrote that. And then I wasn't sure if he understood what I meant by write your name. So I said, Matt, I said, can you write Matt? And then he did the dots. So two different prompts. First was a line, first was dots. Cause he, he knew that this was not what I wanted, but he still didn't know what I wanted. So he changed the line to dots. Just your name, buddy. Last name. and he stays on task. We sat him for a whole hour. He doesn't get out of his chair. He's like, what's next, what's next? It's so great to see how it impacts everyone's life. Mine included. <laughs> I went there the first time with Matt and he got treated and I thought, I just traveled across the world and I didn't get treated. <laughs> So when I went the second time, um, not only did Matt get treated, but I got treated and I took our older son, Sean, and he got treated. Sean, for years, had been kind of dealing with the stomach issues and we've been just kind of battling this issue. Anytime he got overheated or overrun, he would just get sick. And so the three of us were there. We all got treated in the same room. So before I got these, the stem cells in the Ukraine, what happened is I would usually have a stomach pain at least once a week, and I'm better now. I think that's because the stem cells have been really helping a lot. We haven't had any issues since he, he got back. He hasn't had a single issue all summer, which is probably the first summer in his entire life where we haven't had any stomach pains or issues or getting sick, so um, it's been fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And it was great for you because she, I mean, Amanda's yeah. had some elbow pain and some hip pain, and I remember talking to her on the phone like just a couple of days there it's like literally my elbow pain is gone like I can't feel it anymore and my hip feels way better and I'm like you gotta be kidding me no way so it was yeah I, mean, I was blown away when she told me that over the phone so because she's had this elbow pain for I mean years now mm -hmm. so and hip pain as well so it's like it's literally gone so it was pretty awesome yeah I go to school now I got 100% of my spelling test in an effort to fully explain how this therapy is administered, I decided to document myself receiving it for the fifth time, as I have been receiving fetal stem cell therapy almost annually since 2016. Since I am generally healthy, I receive the Anti-Aging Longevity Protocol, which consists of virtually all the same fetal stem cell types that everyone else receives. However, properly designed fetal stem cell therapy is not a one-size-fits-all. M-Cell personalizes each therapy to each patient's needs. Age, medical diagnosis, and other factors determine the overall design of each patient's therapy. When I arrive at the clinic on the first day, M-Cell conducts a comprehensive set of diagnostics, starting with a post-fasting full blood panel, urine analysis, ultrasound of my abdomen, including my prostate, lymph nodes and thyroid, as well as an EKG. After careful review of these diagnostics, it is then customary to have a meeting with my doctor accompanied by an English interpreter. After a physical examination and discussing any specific issues I wish to address, my doctor then explains my personalized three-day treatment protocol. My first round of fetal stem cells lay the foundation for the remainder of my therapy and are injected intravenously. The endothelial cells create new capillaries and small blood vessels and improve microcirculation of my entire organ system. Any small blood vessels that were not functioning properly will be repaired. 
These cells also strengthen the inner wall layers of my larger blood vessels, allowing all fetal stem cells I receive during the course of therapy to reach far throughout my body. Also included are the hepatic cells derived from the liver. They not only improve my liver function, but strengthen my overall blood system. Also derived from the liver are the hematopoietic cells, which stimulate and strengthen my bone marrow for better function and better blood formation. These are the very same liver cell types that were used shortly after Chernobyl and cured Dimitro of a plastic anemia decades earlier. The reason fetal liver cells are so powerful is because they are extracted from the fetal liver at seven to 12 weeks. And these cells at this time of gestation are the foundation, the precursor to the human body's bone marrow itself, and thus the foundation of the human immune system. The premesenchymal cells are supportive cells that can be transformed into any type of cell in my body. Also injected are growth factors and other cells that additionally support this personalized mixture to combine with my own body's chemistry allowing these cells to rapidly reproduce or proliferate after being injected intravenously. These very same stem cells are given in personalized doses to all patients of all ages, regardless of medical diagnosis. Later in the day, I was examined by their ophthalmologist, who concluded that since I am almost 50 years old, I should receive the fetal eye cells to help prevent macular degeneration, a common degenerative eye condition that comes with age. The fetal eye cells were injected into my eye sockets, not my eyes themselves. After a long first day at the clinic, I head back to my hotel for a good night's sleep to get ready for day two. My second day of therapy began with another round of the same fetal stem cells I received intravenously on day one. But later that day, spread throughout seven syringes were a wide variety of neurological related fetal stem cells measured in dosages specifically designed for me. These neurological stem cells were injected subcutaneously. These exact cells are given subcutaneously in higher concentrations to people like Lawrence with multiple sclerosis, but also given intrathecally into his spinal fluid to complement the subcutaneous injections. Bill, who has Parkinson's, was treated in a similar fashion and also received these same cells in higher doses for his diagnosis, but was also injected intrathecally into his spinal fluid. However, for Bill and other patients with Parkinson's, these doctors deliver higher concentrations of the cells containing dopamine progenitor cells, since it is the lack of dopamine that causes Parkinson's. For children with autism, they too get a tailored concentration of the neurological related fetal cells injected subcutaneously. But since intrathecal or spinal injections aren't the most ideal option for a child, M-Cell developed a method of complementing the subcutaneous injections of fetal neuronal cells through intranasal injections, allowing for quick delivery into the brain. After receiving all seven of my subcutaneous injections of the neurological fetal stem cells, the eighth syringe was injected into my muscle, consisting of growth factors and cytokines targeting my gender to stimulate testosterone production. Since we are living in the age of COVID, which can attack our respiratory system, I also received the lung endothelial and hematopoietic stem cells administered through a vaporized inhalation method directly into my lungs. This delivery method was specially designed by M-Cell with COVID in mind, but can also help with those suffering from lung conditions like emphysema or COPD. This inhalation device was designed by M-Cell's team and printed on a 3D printer. This device is one of a kind, the only device like it in the world. Finally, on day three, my last day of therapy, I am given another round of subcutaneous injections, this time 11 of them. 
These injections focus on regenerating a wide array of other organs, in addition to supporting the stem cell injections I received on day one and day two. In my personalized mixture, I also received fetal cardiac cells to protect and regenerate my already healthy heart. But some patients with heart disease receive the fetal cardiac cells along with a mixture of other related fetal stem cells directly into the heart via an intracoronary procedure. This is a chromosome, a long DNA molecule found inside the nucleus of every cell in our body. At the end of each chromosome are telomeres. Each time a cell divides, the telomeres become slightly shorter over time. They eventually become so short that the cell can no longer divide, and the cell dies. Telomerase is an enzyme that promotes the synthesis of telomeres. So when we injected you, uh, the fetal stem cells, we injected not only the cells with long telomere length, we also injected the cells which produce the telomerase, which helps to reconstruct your own cells. When I started receiving fetal stem cell therapy, I had my telomeres measured and repeated the test every year or so. They were measured using the flow fish method, using a flow cytometer, the most accurate method of measuring telomeres available to modern science. In 2017, my median telomere length was 5.38 kilobases, which was low. The mean healthy length in a healthy adult is 6.4 kilobases. However, a year later, my median telomere length jumped to 7.23, and a year after that, jumped to 8.71 and then leveled out to 7.18 kilobases in 2021. Over the course of five years, my average telomere length increased by over 33%. So the telomerase that you produced, you injected me with cells that produced telomerase, right? And which then in turn, perhaps could have also affected my own telomeres. Yeah. Okay, so it's two things happening at the same time. I'm being, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. So I'm being injected with you know, fetal stem cells, which have long telomeres. Yeah. Um, and they're growing and multiplying. Um, yeah. So there's that. That might be the reason why I have such a high number. Combined with telomerase yeah. producing cells from fetal stem cells that are in, also influencing my existing telomeres. Yeah. And what is even more significant is the percentage of long telomeres overall within the total population of my chromosomes. I went from 0.28% of my total cells having long telomeres to 8.52% of my total cell population having long telomeres, resulting in a near 3,000% increase in my cell population with long telomeres. So it means like you have like uh, more time. Yeah. You think and it's going to help me live yeah, longer? Yeah, yeah. It can help you live longer, live better. And this is the proof of the anti-aging. If this is not the proof of the anti-aging, I don't know what we can do more. This is also proof that the fetal stem cells injected into my body for the last seven years have remained in my body. And each new therapy I receive builds upon the previous therapy I've received, bringing us back full circle to how this therapy's mechanism of action was conceived of in the first place. This mechanism of action has been ubiquitously confirmed for decades and published throughout the peer-reviewed medical literature by scientists from all over the world. Inspired first by George Schmorl's observations to a century later when a small group of innovative scientists and doctors administered only fetal liver cells to treat radiation-induced bone marrow failure after Chernobyl, leaving just two Ukrainian scientists who, after succeeding in curing bone marrow failure, later assisted the Ukrainian government in creating new legislation within its Ministry of Health to formally legalize and regulate fetal stem cells for human use. And now, more than 30 years of research later, this technology has been handed off to a new larger team of over two dozen Ukrainian doctors and scientists who have taken the reins to expand this technology into utilizing virtually all of the important organ systems of the human body. 
From the brain and central nervous system, treating Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's, brain injuries, and autism. To fetal heart stem cells, potentially eliminating the need for heart surgeries and heart medication. Kidney and adrenal cells. Stem cells from the pancreas, which contain insulin-producing cells to treat diabetes, as well as the foundation of the entire blood, bone marrow, and circulatory system, which can treat a host of various immunological diseases. This technology has even cured male infertility in men who had tried and failed every possible fertility treatment known to modern science by utilizing the testicular-related fetal stem cells. Yet, somehow, the rest of the world has either never heard of this technology, doesn't understand this technology, or if they are quietly researching it outside of Ukraine, many are forced to work in the shadows out of fear for their lives. I even reached out to some of the world's leading stem cell experts, like world-renowned biologist James Thompson, featured on the cover of Time magazine as the man who brought you stem cells. I informed him I was investigating fetal stem cell therapy and was looking for an expert opinion. He replied by stating, I'm sorry, but it is outside of my area of expertise. I have reached out to scientists affiliated with the largest stem cell organization in the United States, the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, or CIRM, who works with certain scientists researching fetal stem cells in mice, like Dr. Eileen Anderson, who was recently granted over $5 million to study human neural cells for spinal cord injury who said during a 2020 presentation when asked directly. Greg says, what is the source for human neural stem cells? What sources have you studied to determine which works better? Well, um, we have studied uh, induced pluripotent cells, reprogrammed cells, ES-derived cells, and fetal tissue-derived neural stem cells. Out of those, fetal tissue-derived neural stem cells works hands down the best in our hands. We have yet to have success in our hands, in our models, with an induced pluripotent cell, stem cell, a, a reprogrammed somatic cell, a developed neural stem cell product. In fact, what we get really efficiently is tumor formation, which is very disappointing and not something that you want to have in the clinic. And um, the ES cells that we've worked with, embryonic stem cells that we've neuralized to be neural stem cells, I would say 50% of the lines we've tested have given some evidence of repair, but very, very small in terms of magnitude, nothing like what we've seen um, with the tissue-derived neural stem cells. Dr. Anderson, like all other Western scientists working with fetal tissue that I contacted, failed to respond to any of my repeated attempts to invite them to participate in this documentary. I know some sci scientists which in the past work with the fetal stem cells, but due to the ethical issues and illegalness of working this, with this uh, stem cell type. They start uh, research and wanted to find the alternative solution or alternative stem cells for treatment uh, as the fetal stem cells. But for the last 10 years, they didn't find anything what can be so effective as the fetal stem cells because I really visit quite a lot of the conference and on each conference I met the person or scientist or professor which has uh, some researchers in the past with the fetal stem cells. They do not want to talk about that on the publicity, but all of them told me that I'm lucky one because I have opportunity to work with them. It is estimated that of the 8 billion people alive on Earth today, only around 25,000 people in human history have received fetal stem cell therapy. The reason you may have never heard of this technology is because in all of human history, only 0.0003% of the human race has ever received it. The countries in blue are where the routine application of fetal stem cell therapy is prohibited. 
which includes Mexico. As today's Mexican law clearly states, Chapter 3, Transplant, Article 330, it is forbidden the use for any purpose of embryonic or fetal tissues resulting from abortions, which leaves this one country in Europe being the only place on planet Earth where a human being can legally obtain fetal stem cell therapy. Ukraine. When Russia began their invasion of Ukraine on February 24, 2022, with the intention of erasing Ukraine's existence, imagine how this made Sophia feel, knowing that this therapy is the only thing keeping her alive. Imagine how it made these people feel, knowing that the only therapy allowing them to live normal lives is under threat. If Ukraine's government falls into Russian rule, fetal stem cell therapy is gone. But no different than how the brave, innovative people of Ukraine have managed to prevent Russia from destroying them, M-Cell still stands. Its scientists are still hard at work, and people who need this therapy are still traveling to Ukraine to receive it, regardless of the danger. On September 16th, 2022, my wife and I packed our bags and camera equipment and flew from Los Angeles to Warsaw, Poland. Due to Russia's invasion, flying into Ukraine was not an option. So we headed to Warsaw's international train station to board a train to Kyiv, Ukraine, where we met up with five other Americans, Julie, Diana, Sanzella, Sophia, and Adonis. We all joked about how most of our friends and family back home were confused as to why we were all heading to Ukraine during a war, having to remind them that Ukraine is the only place on earth where we can receive fetal stem cell therapy. And for Sophia and Adonis, their very lives depend on it. We noticed that most everyone on our train from Warsaw to Kyiv were women and children. Since the train ride is 17 hours, we got the private sleeper car, which is essentially a Manhattan studio apartment that travels. After a bit of a night's sleep, I went in to check on Diana and Sophia. Oh, hello. Come oh, on. Oh, hello. I mean, how was this trip different than the previous ones? It's a lot longer. I'm not going to ever complain about the other trip again. <laughs> So how long have we been on this train so far? Like 16 hours, I think. Yeah. It's been a long uh, 16 hours so far. And, um, but, you know, I appreciate the fact that we can even come, to be totally honest. So it's like this balance of this is really long and it's really hard. And then yet this appreciation of the fact that we're even able to come is, I'm beyond grateful because at one point I wasn't sure earlier this year we were going to be able to do this or not. So, I, you know, hard to complain about what I'm grateful for. At the same time, this is brutally long. Um, and I, I look forward to when we can come back in peacefully through our normal means of, you know, flying into Kiev. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm actually really grateful to be here. I so much of enjoying this countryside though. It's absolutely it is. breathtaking to me. I love this. Especially when the sun was setting and the oh. trees were like golden. So beautiful. It was a beautiful sense of it. Yeah, it really was. And honestly, the appreciation of just, honest, just my heart felt like being here and and just what these people have gone through this last year. I mean, I was sick to my stomach when this whole thing broke out, obviously, because I'm connected. 
and just to be here is like this almost I don't know how, how you describe it but it's almost like such a respect for what they've had to go through and the fact that we even get to come here and that they're fighting for their own lives and that you know we're also fighting for our lives in some ways but um, to call it just this appreciation that I have is even renewed I already loved it before but this is a whole nother level so much love and respect for these people 100 percent yeah hey there I was hoping this was the right room yes. <laughs> that's, a good, the right that's room. a good guess <laughs> prior to this journey I had never met Adonis and Zanzella in person. I want to ask you first, Adonis, what do you feel about all of this? You've experienced this journey. Uh, it, it's, it's cool. Yeah? You've enjoyed it? Yeah. Yeah? Have you ever been on a train ride like this before? No. no. We were here last November and we were able to just fly in to the airport in Kiev and get picked up. and. This trip is totally different. I didn't think we would ever be able to come back, obviously. I'm just glad that we're able to join you guys on this trip. Yeah, I, I, I really didn't think we would go back ever. So I'm glad we all got to meet up. I'm really enjoying the company and it's it's been nice, honestly, yeah. Sophia and Adonis are the only two children I've met who were treated with fetal stem cells for muscular dystrophy. This will be Adonis's second time receiving therapy. After he received the treatment, he told me that he was sleeping better and he, he wasn't waking up in the middle of the night for air. So now he's sleeping all the night long, yes. right? Yes. Okay. And no breathing no problems. No breathing problems. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Maybe something else. Yes. Notice. Yes, and um, he's able to walk longer distances. Uh -huh. Something else, maybe? Yes, and then he also his hand strength improved, mm -hmm. and he's able to lift heavier weights mm -hmm. now. Is there something you would like to add? Um, no, just okay. We've uh, seen major improvements, so yeah. That's uh, what this will be Sophia's 10th annual fetal stem cell treatment, and for her mother, Diana, her fourth. So we'd like to know what is uh, the biggest changes since the previous treatment you've been here. Um, walking has been a lot easier. Like, I've been able to walk longer distances. Like four... Four miles? I don't, yeah, four miles. Four miles, like four miles. Okay, cool. Uh, Any other changes except this one? Um. Not that I can think of. She's gained weight. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's good. <laughs> good. Sophia and Adonis receive both intravenous and subcutaneous injections of a wide array of fetal stem cells. But due to the nature of muscular dystrophy and how it uniformly causes atrophy in all muscles of the body, these doctors also inject certain fetal stem cells into their arms and legs to directly target those muscles. We checked in on Julie, who was on the same train with us and has been receiving fetal stem cell therapy to help in her recovery from Lyme disease. Julie's chronic Lyme disease had been systematically causing damage to her joints, organs, brain, and spine. It feels so good to be back. I'm so happy and grateful that we were able to come um, especially with everything going on and that they've been through a lot, but they're very strong people. Also joining us at MCEL was another American named Lee. But Lee took a train from Krakow instead of Warsaw. This is my fourth time at MCEL. Um, this time was different though because there's a war going on. The number one prescription in America is thyroid medication. And guess what you don't need to take if you get fetal stem cells? You don't need to take your thyroid medication. At least I don't. I don't need to take a million different medications um, that I would normally have needed to take, so. Finally, the ninth American in our group was Dean, who booked super last minute and had to take a bus from Warsaw to Kiev, since all trains were sold out. This was my first time meeting Dean in person. Speaking to the Ukrainian people that run the clinic before I got here, I felt connected with them because they're so sweet and just real, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and. And then getting here and, and realizing like what 
Russia is doing to these people and dehumanizing them and writing them out of their textbooks in Russia, writing Ukraine out of textbooks. It's so disgusting that these are people, this is a civilization here, this is a very civilized society. The people are really such special people. They have a great culture, great food, great treatment in this amazing center like that you can't get anywhere else in the world. They would never do this treatment in the United States. So I feel privileged to have gotten here and it was worth the trek. Even with the danger element, I'm still happy that I made it and I would do it again. And I might even stay a few, a few extra days to enjoy the city. And since we spent more than 30 hours traveling from Los Angeles to Ukraine to document this part of the story, my wife and I also got the therapy. Um, I'm going to ask you a personal question about this subject. How does it make you feel working in the world of stem cells, knowing that such a large amount of clinics are offering only one stem cell type, usually from the fat or the bone marrow, and they're cultivating them, and then they're giving them to the patient, and that patient is hoping to have a huge health benefit. How does that make you feel as someone in this profession? Hmm. You know, they don't have any other ways to do. They have very uh, restrict rules of using of their stem cells. That's why they can use only that type of the stem cells and they need to believe that that types of the stem cells will help. But um, when we have opportunity to use the fetal stem cells, to use uncultivated stem cells, of course it's much better and it's really unique because in, only in Ukraine we can free you, use and also research the fetal stem cells. And I'm sure that in, in the nearest future, uh, almost all researchers will agree that the fetal stem cells is the most unique so source of the different stem cell types, and maybe even the only one source of them. You know, a lot of patients ask us, uh, why do you do not, don't work in America? Or uh, why you don't work in some countries of Europe? Um, why you just work only in Ukraine? Um, you know, the, the most simplest answer is that only in Ukraine we really can use and research uh, the fetal stem cells. Uh, in all other countries, it's illegal. Now, the history of that, we have the Chernobyl, and so we start uh, trying to help the people. And uh, this was one of the researchers uh, to use uh, fetal stem cell from the liver, fetal liver uh, tissue, uh, to help the people with the radioactive irradiation. And that's why it becomes legal to, to research fetal stem cells. And thanks God, they do not closed everything in like few years and it's developed all the time. And when we are talking about the compa comparing other researchers of the people in the world and the researches which are done in Ukraine and in cell, it's not the comparable. So we know about the fetal stem cells more than anybody else in the world. We have used fetal stem cells for clinical application more than anybody in the world. So it's really, for me, it's really cool that I work here and I have opportunity to work with the um, most effective stem cells. And they're not comparable to any other types of the stem cells. This is Dr. Vadim, the ophthalmologist who performed my eye injections. This is what Russia did to his home in Irpin. But Dr. Vadim is alive and well. In fact, the whole team is still alive and well. Is this uh, emotional for you? Yeah, because you know, 
like all these arms they actually came to Ukraine to kill us Ukrainian and to to kill Ukraine in general as a country they officially announced that uh, on the August 24th when we have the Independence Day in Ukraine they will make the parade using their arms on the Khrushchev which is the main street so that's like the symbolic answer to them that here is your parade with all your arms just destroyed arms this is dr maria who performed my ultrasound якщо почитати нашу історію дана ситуація вже йде великою кількістю років вона починаючи ще з середньовікової ери кожні плюс-мінус 100 років йде геноцид українського народу тобто ми з цим живемо це наша генетична пам'ять і ми до цього не те що звикли але ми цього чекали but the war gave us the most powerful thing understanding that we are as united and strong as we never been before Let's go. Let's okay. go.